I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of the Most Painful Podcast. Suffering from chronic pain can have a severe impact on a person's quality of life. Psychedelics are being talked about as a treatment to help people suffering from chronic pain. But does it really work? To talk about the effectiveness of psychedelics, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Verbrower. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. And also, I'd like to welcome Bruno Gavimont, who's a veteran and a consultant to the psychedelic industry. And as well, I'd like to welcome Aaron Victory, a veteran and a consultant to psychedelics uh, industry as well. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Thanks, Tom. Before we get into the conversation, I want to let our guests know that we have an announcement for a gift at the end of the show. So please stay tuned and we'll give you the details to that. So on one of our past podcasts, we talked about the effectiveness of cannabis and how it can help somebody with chronic pain or may not help somebody with chronic pain, depending. But what about psychedelics? What's it all about? So, Michael, maybe you can start us off and tell us what are psychedelics and uh, what's this? Uh, how can it help with chronic pain? Yeah, thanks for uh, having me and thanks for everybody else joining today. Psychedelics are these molecules that we've known about for 70, 80, 90 plus years but have probably been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And what these molecules do is essentially they kind of work on a bunch of receptors in our brain. But but to kind of just summarize it, I'd say it allows the brain to temporarily disconnect from its ordinary thoughts. And that can benefit many people. Anybody who's ruminating about anything, be it depression, anxiety, pain, if you're in a constant state of rumination, being able to just break that trend is what is so therapeutic about a drug like a psychedelic. So these are relatively safe molecules. They've been studied for many years in terms of their harms and risks and potential benefits. The only issue we kind of face is the legality around them and the way that they're going to come to market has to be through some of these clinical trials, it seems like. And what's remarkable about these medicines is that uh, early data shows that just a single dose might be able to alleviate, for example, anxiety in end-of-life patients for five years which is remarkable. It's a paradigm shift in how we approach medicine. Um, Today, we give people prescription pills. They take them every day, and we try to help them with their symptoms. With psychedelics, we're actually trying to uncover the root cause of a lot of illness and suffering. We're bringing that to the surface and facing it, and that allows for healing. So, I mean, that's a good overview on it. It's kind of interesting that you're saying that one dose could take care of that for five years. That's, and I'd like to dive a little deeper with that. But when we look at the veterans community, I mean, we talked about cannabis in the past. Aaron, what's the the knowledge in the veterans community about psychedelics and, and how they can help somebody? In the Canadian veteran community, I think is a, an anomaly as a demographic because you see Canadian veterans getting coverage for psychedelic assisted therapy, specifically ketamine as the uh, psychedelic molecule being used and the availability of the cannabis reimbursement program without, you know, a mountain of, uh, of reviewed data and on compassionate grounds back in 2007, I think makes Canadian veterans interesting in the way that they've received psychedelic treatment. So there's currently thousands of, uh, of veterans out there who are trying microdosing or macrodosing psilocybin. At this time in Canada, there's currently three legal access pathways for psychedelics for Canadian veterans, one being Section 56-1 sub-exemptions, which uh, absolutely have their list of pros and cons. The other is to be a member of the study group in a clinical trial, and the other is through what's called the SAP or Special Access Program, which is a a unique program uh, that Health Canada as a regulator provides. And what happened is, is in 2022, this past January 5th, uh, amendments to the food and drug regulations were put in place to allow psilocybin and MDMA in the special access program. So currently there's about a dozen approved SAPs that have gone through, majority for end of life. And the changes in the regulatory system through the SAP are what I believe are going to be the next step in broader access to psychedelics. It's a niche program, but it is still a federally regulated system of access to psilocybin and MDMA psychedelic assisted therapy. And from uh, and Bruno, I want to bring bring you in on this too because you know you've been on TV talking about it. Uh, w five, I believe, was a show you're on. So, for someone who's taken it, you have chronic pain. How did you find it helped you? How did you know about it first of all, and how did it help you? 
Yeah, very good question. And uh, thank you for Michael and Aaron to really bring in all the scientific and d the correct way to get it. Because the thing is, is that as we all know, we grew up to say no to drugs and to be careful about what we're taking. These drugs are illegal. And when you're taking guys who are veterans, um, you know, for me, I was a straight arrow and even taking when we talked about medicinal marijuana for chronic pain, it was the same thing for psychedelic. But we get to a certain point where we're resistant to any type of the traditional therapy, whether that be talk therapy or SSRIs or anything that the normal way of doing things doesn't work anymore because of the trauma that we faced. So what happened is that you start doing some research. And for me, what it was, was, hey, somebody who was talking about ayahuasca, there's documentary, which is DMT, uh, other documentaries, and uh, the United States Veterans Affair, we're doing a lot of trials with LSD. Now we're talking about two really potent medicine here. And we had heard about mushrooms, which is psilocybin and MDMA and ketamine. And Suddenly, at the beginning of COVID, there was this opportunity, like Aaron mentioned, there was a trial from this organization called Field Trip, which Michael, uh, Dr. Michael works at. And they were offering to do some trials for veterans. And I jump on the opportunity, having been on trial with the psilocybin before and seeing what uh, Dr. Verbora said was getting that little kind of break or a new way of seeing things. And what I really appreciated, which is really important, is that, you know, we can go, there are healers in the community, like he said, for thousands of years, it's been doing of healing with plants and doing these things. The thing is that what I found was different, which is really important with the special access program is that, that the assisted psychotherapy that goes with it. Let's just not take something and then feel a certain way. Let's look at what our problems or issues are. Let's then use this medicine and then let's have an integration and talk about what it is that you've noticed. We now know that the science has proven that the, the regeneration of neuroplasticity into the brain, which is creating new path, neural pathways, and that's what the medicine is doing. But on an experiential side of things is that it got me a chance to take a break and actually feel love, feel connected, feel grounded, and looking at things from a different perspective Actually, it pulled me out of, you know, that quote that says you can't see the whole frame when you're standing in the picture. It basically pulled me out of the picture so that I could look at the full frame and have a good discussion with my psychotherapist about what I should do next. And that was, you know, in 2020. And now my experiences with psychedelic has helped tremendously. I'm completely transformed because of it. So, I mean, that's uh, good to hear. And so I put it back to Michael. When we, when we talk about this, I'm thinking chronic pain. If someone is, you know, suffering with chronic pain, we have the biopsychosocial of chronic pain. So they take this psychedelic, it removes them, or as Bruno would say, takes them out of the frame. What's the longevity then if someone's still struggling with, say, low back pain or they have neck pain or like how does psychedelics play a role in that? There's not a ton of research on psychedelics with chronic pain disorders, truthfully. The major research would be with psilocybin and certain types of headaches called cluster headaches. So there is definitely a huge gap between how it's being used for chronic pain and versus what the evidence shows. So we have to close that gap in the, in the coming years. But I can tell you as somebody who also works with cannabis and who also has prescribed thousands of patients with chronic pain different medicines, I can tell you that after you've been dealing with pain for three months, you're really dealing with a mental health related chronic pain component. You can have tissue damage and it hurts. You could also have no tissue damage and it still hurts. And what happens is, is you know, the body, if it keeps set, sending signals to the brain about pain, eventually the brain starts looking for signals, okay? We call that chronic neuropathic pain. And so any medicine that allows you to take a break from experiencing that, that rumination or that reverse retrograde signal, whether it's THC, psilocybin, ketamine, and these are all probably just different shades of potency, psychedelics being a lot more potent, it allows you to kind of breathe, take a breath and realize that like, wait a minute. If I can just feel no pain for two, three hours, how did, how did my brain do that? My leg didn't change. My arm didn't change. And so it starts that curiosity. And that's where the therapy comes in, right? So we know that cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain is probably one of the best treatments. If you combine that with psychedelics, I anticipate in a couple of years, we'll have evidence to demonstrate that what would take months or years to achieve with therapy alone, with the combination of psychedelics, you'll be able to do in weeks or months. And I think that's where we have to push the research. 
Um, and I think many people who deal with chronic pain suffer from all the issues that uh, psychedelics benefit, depression, anxiety, trauma. So instead of looking at health and like all these pieces of individuals, you have pain, you have depression, we have to look much more holistically and say, you have a lot of suffering. How do we alleviate your suffering? And these psychedelics allow you to do that. And th that's a very good point, Michael. If I could add to Mike Michael's point, Tom, the data shows that close to 70% of Canadian veterans who have a diagnosis for chronic pain also have a comorbid diagnosis for post-traumatic stress as well. So the connection between the me mental and the physical and how psychedelics could aid in that way, reference chronic pain ostensibly to treat the mental health condition. I think that's a, a, a very salient point when it comes to the Canadian veteran population. I agree with both. What does that look like when you're the patient? It looks like, um, you know, what Michael said, you're feeling better. You feel good about yourself. It helps you forget about the pain that you were in and what, and now you're op more open to listen to what's out there. If we work on, on CBT, right. And we work on all these things. The thing is, is that sometimes you're so much in the dark and so much in pain, it becomes this vicious cycle of which is causing which. Right. We've all been in pain. We've all been playing sports. We've know how to push the body. But when you're feeling good about it, is the pain the same? That's what it is. So I think it alleviates on that. Yeah, And I would suggest adding to that, you know, we've talked about military culture and identity and people who know me. That's kind of the shtick that I push because we've seen vets will do well in a pain program. But then when they leave the pain program and they're struggling for purpose or they're struggling for mission for self last. It's kind of hard to look after pain when you're always putting yourself last. So perhaps this helps in kind of, I don't know, Bruno and Aaron, I mean, both of you guys have been involved in this, but perhaps it helps from that standpoint as well is give a, the person opportunity to remove themselves and then say, how have they changed and how are they going to move forward in life? You know, so I'll open that up to you guys. Well, that's, that's another interesting point, Tom. So a lot of what the psychotherapists are, are trying to get at the core of, and particularly with veterans, is like an ego dissolution. The point where they can actually have an, a layman's perspective, obviously, but the point where the patient can actually have an honest conversation about what the core root traumas are and then be able to process them more quickly. And whether it's ketamine or MDMA with the work that MAPS is doing or psilocybin in some of the phase, you know, two A, B and uh, three trials that are happening, they're seeing that patients are saying that it feels like I've done, you know, X amount of therapy in just this one hour. I feel like I've worked through so much more and I've tried cognitive behavior therapy alone, or I've tried EMDR, or, you know, the list goes on with the, the traditional talk therapies that veterans would avail of. But they say that they feel like it gives them the ability to process the trauma quicker and to take themselves outside of the situation and not feel those levels of heightened anxiety and, you know, awareness that would be a hindrance to what the psychotherapist was trying to achieve in the session. Yeah. And absolutely what Aaron says is, is, is I'm going to bring it back to experiential is for two years now with the procedure that I used to get, which would work for me for my lower back injuries is no longer available in my region. And we haven't found it. You're, you're aware of it, Tom. The thing is, is that because of psychedelics, this pain is mitigated. I can deal with it on a daily basis. I have new options. I'm doing yoga. I'm actually taking teacher yoga training now because now I've had the ability to look at it from a different lens, if that helps in any way, because of psychedelics, what they both said, instead of taking months from being told by a physio, if we do this certain movement with this elastic band and all these things, and you're not there in your headspace, you're just in pain, you want the pain to stop. Psychedelics does that in a shorter time. It doesn't fix all your problem, but what it does is that it creates new way of looking at things and making taking you that breeder for you to start looking what is going to work for me. I think that's what it is. Yeah, and I think what you said is looking through a different lens. And I mean, all three of us have served. We know that uh, I would suggest we've changed, but a lot of us don't see it because that change happens over a very slow period of time. You know, uh, for me, when you leave the service, it's hard to look through a different lens. So maybe that's what we need is to have a different lens to look through. So it works. Sounds like it works. But what's the longevity of that, Michael? Like, so, okay, I, I take it. I go through the whole process like Bruno Aaron did, and I feel great. What's the follow-up? What's the longevity of it? Do, does a person regress back? Is it, you know? Well, that's probably where another gap in the literature is. And, and the problem is, is 
you know, we've been trained in Western medicine to think that like, we're going to study these drugs and everybody's going to have the same longevity. And it's like, that's nonsense. Like each of us has our own problems. We're very unique individuals. If I'm starting very, very low and I'm very, very much suffering, I'm going to need five, six doses, maybe 10 doses over two, three years to get there. But if I'm already doing really well and I already have good support mechanisms, I have good financial supports, I have a therapist, I have coaching, I have all those access, I might only need two or three sessions to get to where I need to be. So this whole notion that like, you know, each of us, like we're going to find one protocol that's going to work for everybody. I think it's a little bit silly. Like we really have to respect the fact that each of us heals at our own pace. The pace at which each person heals is is very unique. Um, but the beauty of this is what the data shows thus far is that a single session for some people is lasting as much as five years, which is remarkable. Like if you're taking a pill, just one pill a day, that's what, 1600 pills versus one dose of psilocybin. That's a paradigm shift. That's massive, right? What these drugs are doing is no other drugs can really do them to the degree. It's creating new neural pathways in the brain. So when you go skating down or skiing down a hill and you make deep strides into that hill and you go back to the top of the hill, it becomes easier and easier to just get stuck in that same path down the hill. It's the same thing that happens in our brain. And, and we always said you can't teach old brains new tricks, but psychedelics allow for neuroplasticity. They allow you to get fresh perspectives. And so those old pathways that are pain and suffering start to, to dwindle away because you start to reinforce the positive ones with psychotherapy. So longevity, we still have a lot of questions and answers, but I think most people would say they'll take it. For, the, for some, some of the sickest patients I see, they'll probably come in for a session every three, maybe six months, which is not bad at all compared to you know traditional options, right? And what is it? Is it ketamine? Or what, what is the... That's predominantly, yeah, that's predominantly with ketamine today. So again, we'd have to compare all these things. Like PTSD is probably, the, the right ingredient is probably MDMA. It's probably not ketamine. It's probably not psilocybin. But ketamine is really the only one we can work I with. I would second that. Yeah. <laughs> MDMA is the magical one. <laughs> yeah. And I think what you find is people start to go on their own journey and then they start to get intuition about like what they need when they need it. Um, and the other thing we have to be clear about is these are not addictive substances. They're very anti-addictive. If you meet someone who goes through a very difficult or, or a rough experience, or even if it's a beautiful, blissful experience, they come out and say, man, I got a lot of crap I got to work with. It's going to take me months to go through that. Like, I don't want to touch this drug for like three, four, five months. Like, it's beautiful, but it's given me so much wisdom that like, I got a lot of material to work with my therapist now. And I'll come back and see you when I figure out this stuff. Yeah. And and if I can just add on to that, Tom, for the experience side, I'll, that's what going to be my role today is just that with the ketamine, we, we did some incredible work with the psychotherapist and I had an opportunity to go with the MDMA and I did try the MDMA and then we got reconnected. But what he said was exactly true, was like, oh, my God, I got so much work to do. And it wasn't an overwhelming like it was before. It was a man, I want to do this work. This is now it's very clear for me. And I've also been to the other end of that. And I'm going to be honest with everybody where I went and I said, I'm going to take MDMA. And I took MDMA. And the second day I took MDMA. And the third day I took MDMA. And here's what happened. I was getting less effect and less effect. And on the third day, I said, I don't want to touch this stuff for for at least a couple months. And that's what happened. They're not addictive. They're very good for you. And they change the the way you look at things. I just want to reiterate on that. Like all three of you said, there's still a lot of research to do and a lot of trials to to see what the outcome is. And, and education. I mean, you know, I had a, a veteran who wrote into the show and said that, uh, you know, yeah, I'd like to try cannabis, but I've always been raised that it's a drug and I shouldn't take it, right? So, I mean, Bruno, you and Aaron, both of you talked about that. So, I think the education is a huge piece as well. And so, and Tom, if I can just because you're on that st on that subject, a book that really helped me about the legality of things and how it all happened was Psychedelic Medicine: The Healing Power of LSD MDMA by Dr. Richard Lewis Miller. It's an incredible book for people just starting up and doing the research of what it does, the dosage, and where it went in the court systems and everything and why it was deemed, you know, Schedule 1 and all these things so that you can get an understanding to start changing the narrative. That's a really good book to listen to or to read. Okay. Thanks for that. Aaron, you got anything to add before we wrap up? No, no. Thanks for having me, Tom. I appreciate the time and I appreciate the, the group's time. It was, uh, it was nice to hear the perspectives. So research wise and resources, I know Bruno, you talked about the book. Michael, is there, you know, any of the universities or is there 
anywhere people can go? Or is it just not enough research out there at this time for people to get information? Well, there's there's a ton of research on phase three studies, which are you know well done. And if you want to see a summary of that, I would check out the MAPS website, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Okay. Um, they have a nice summary of all the different substances and conditions that they're studying. And you can read those studies if you're interested and get summaries. And that's probably yeah. where I would have. MAPS is definitely the guy to go and see. So MAPS. So for our listeners, it's MAPS. Perfect. Well, thank you, the three of you. And uh, for our listeners, if there's any feedback about the show or information on chronic pain, you can always visit the website veteranschronicpain.ca or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at chronicpaincoe and at Instagram at chronicpain underscore coe. So having said that, we have an offer from Dr. Peter Atea, who is um, well known for his podcast on health and wellness. And I've been following him for some time. And I found that his evidence-based information has been very helpful in many areas of health. So if you're sending questions into us that are relevant to this show or to the cannabis show, uh, we're going to take the uh, top 10 questions and you'll get a free subscription to Peter's site where you'll have access to all his information of uh, health and wellness. And once again, if you just send your question to an email or message us to veterans at chronicpain.ca or on Facebook and Twitter, at chronic pain coe or on instagram at chronic pain underscore coe michael thank you for being on the show your insight was very helpful and aaron thanks to you as well and bruno both of you from a veteran's point of view and what you have gone through i think is very helpful for the vets and um, i think uh, we could have talked longer on this subject i mean to me it's new and i don't know much about it and i'm sure many listeners don't as well so uh, thank you for the three of you for attending the show and to our listeners stay well The most painful podcast is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network and Eye Contact Productions.